So I'm John Copans. I work for the Council on Rural Development, and I am facilitating this session today. And um, I, I think Jenna and uh, uh, Commissioner Hanford gave you a feel for what this is about. I want to emphasize that this is uh, really primarily about hearing from you all. We'll, we'll facilitate a conversation, but the idea is, is to hear from you all uh, the topic of this particular session is around community unity and health. So hopefully you've come to the right room. If not, I can help you find, uh, I can give you directions to the, uh, to, the uh, uh, to another virtual room. But, um, you know, as we get started in this conversation, one thing that I sort of reflect on is that we are, what is different about this particular, I guess, challenge of COVID-19 is that it's, it's got a different time scale than, uh, than a, a typical disaster, right? We think about weather disasters where there's an incident and then there's the response and the recovery. And this, um, this doesn't really feel that way. It's sort of this rolling thing and we all have different experiences as we go through it. And it, um, there's an ebb and flow to it. And so, you know, as uh, we think a lot about sort of response, recovery, and renewal, sort of as different phases. And I think the reality of this time is that we're kind of in all of that at the same time, right? We're responding to immediate needs because there's a lot of Vermonters really struggling to meet their immediate needs. And so we're in that response phase of making sure people have a roof over their head, that they're healthy, that they've got food on the table uh, and those basic needs. There's that response. Then there's the recovery of like, how do we get back to quote unquote normal? And then, uh, and then we think about renewal, which is what does Vermont's future look like? And in fact, does this challenging moment provide some opportunity to create a new future for our communities and our state? So it's sort of, uh, so this conversation, I guess part of why I say that as we get started is I'm giving you all permission, not that I need to, to, to cover all of that. Don't feel like you're, you should be stuck in like the response mode. It, it can be interesting to have conversations because some people are really very much living in the day to day. Other people are thinking much further out in terms of where, uh, where the future looks like. And I'm just saying to you all that all of that is important in this conversation. And so don't, uh, don't be shy about, uh, about participating. Um, I wanna acknowledge, uh, we have some visiting team members and I also wanna acknowledge we have a scribe here, Elena. Elena, uh, I don't know how to pr pronounce your last name. Maybe you could do it, but... Um, Elena is taking notes for us. And so I just wanted to let you know, like the nice thing for me as a facilitator is um, we've got someone here whose job, sole job is to take notes. So that's helpful because that a lot of this is about gathering input that we will feed, uh, feed into both the task force and, and the governor's office. So thank you, Elena, for that. And I also want to acknowledge a few visiting team members, which include uh, Will Eberly and, uh, Bonnie Wan Wanninger from uh, the Regional Planning Commission. And finally, now I'm gonna introduce uh, Monique Priestley, who is from the Space on Main over in Bradford and has some other roles too, which she'll share with you. I'm, they're so new that I they don't come off my tongue yet. But, um, and Monique is actually, as we get started, Monique's gonna share some reflections about the work that's been going on over in Bradford just to kind of get us started. And then I'll start facilitating our conversation. So with that, uh, Monique, take it away. Okay, cool. Um, and I apologize. I have to, I'm trying to juggle three Zooms right now. <laughs> so I'm going to go real quick and I'm going to jump off and I'll be back. Um, so I guess um, Nick just shared, said to share a zillion things. So I'm not sure. Uh, I guess the main thing would be that um, I've been involved in kind of Bradford community stuff for um, I guess the last 10 years now, 11 years now. Um, and on different boards and different volunteer capacities, um, all of which kind of led me to starting a co-working space um, on Main Street in Bradford. Um, and it's really kind of turned into a 
not only support for remote workers, but support for um, like organizations that don't have meeting places anywhere else. Like we don't have any accessible um, and tech oriented uh, meeting spaces at all in our town or our area um, within probably like the, you know, the surrounding towns, 10 towns. Um, and then also just like kind of a community space where we have um, things like uh, concerts or um, we've had movies or craft fairs. Um, we have a code for UV brigade that's meeting right now to work on some tech projects for um, local nonprofits, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and I would say, so that kind of, uh, meanwhile, I have worked in technology and for a software company for the last, I've worked in technology for the last 19 years and we just left a software company of the last decade um, of working remotely. Um, um, and uh, I don't know where I was going with that, <laughs> um, but uh, I guess on the side, so that's professionally, but all of the stuff outside of those hours has been on community development, economic development, um, in a way that I didn't really realize I was jumping into that until I was in it. <laughs> um, and so I just left and have started working for the Center for Women in Enterprise. Um, and, but the community aspect uh, joined the Vermont Council on Rural Development Board and because of COVID and kind of being connected to all the different community groups um, when, and I wasn't here during Irene, um, but when COVID hit, uh, started asking around to public safety and the select board asking what we were gonna do to respond um, and really nobody had any plans. <laughs> um, so I asked if it would be okay to not step on toes, but to jump into that. So. Um, we started a uh, kind of a mutual aid group. I was seeing the stuff that was happening on Facebook coming out of the University of Chicago. Um, and so we popped up a kind of a mutual aid group, which then with concerns of financial stuff and insurance um, ended up getting the town to take us under uh, that under the town as a formal commission. Um, and so I've been just kind of working with the Vermont Council on Rural Development on all of the community um, gatherings with all the mutual aid um, volunteers. And it's been amazing to see what's good. One, to see the different people who have hopped on calls. It's it's not the traditional role. Uh, there's a lot more diversity, which has been awesome in, in all different aspects. Um, and I guess the next thing for Bradford is trying to figure out, there's been such great things coming horrible things coming out of COVID, but great things coming out of COVID as far as like transparency, communication, um, and trying to like figure out, that's always been a weak point. Um, and we've kind of rallied and trying to keep that going, um, I guess in the future. John, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> oh. That's great, Monique. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess maybe a little more of a prompt though about sort of how, how do you feel like just as we get started, as you've pulled that together in Bradford, any, any sort of techniques for pulling sort of a disparate group into a common, common conversation there? Yeah, um, so I think the, the big thing there was there was already t kind of a little bit of a multi-sectoral that was a little bit limited to kind of the, you know, the who's who type um, behind closed doors type operators. Um, but I was part of that kind of group um, and so kind of hijacked one of some of those meetings uh, to expand it to be more than just like the select board and planning commission and the banks and that kind of stuff to be uh, the libraries and to inv involve people um, that were heading up transportation, housing, uh, the schools, youth sports, the mentoring projects, the health clinics, um, and just trying to really, so we, I guess my first initial list was 50 people. Um, and for the first few weeks, like uh, most of those people, I would say 40 of them were joining. Um, it's dwindled down to like 30, sometimes 20. Um, but that group has still continued to meet. And even though COVID isn't in our area necessarily, we're not seeing huge um, uh, needs for volunteers and food because we stood up a, a huge volunteer effort of, like I think it was like 120 people when we posted our form, um, which those people that many of them had never, never seen them volunteer. So it was, it was crazy to see that. And then we put a whole um, kind of uh, structure in place that where we had, I had like 10 team leads that would have like 10 people each and some overflow. Um, and we were meeting weekly to kind of coordinate any efforts that came in. Um, I used a lot of my software background to stand up like support ticket systems to, to funnel support requests, um, needs for uh, requests for help. Um, 
but the even we still are meeting um, every other week for the kind of the Bradford resilience group um, and even though there's not necessarily a lot of needs going on um, it's the first like I would say it's the first ongoing uh, kind of ch like space that people from all these sectors are still listening to each other um, they're still joining the call they're still like, new people are sharing like the librarian is sharing things that I'm sure a majority of the group has never really kept tabs on. Um, the same with the select board. Um, so it's been, they've all, e each week I ask, do, like, do we still need to meet every other week or should we change it to less? But each week they still want to keep doing it because it's still really the only forum that they've come all come together in one spot to support each other. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will keep going. That's great. Super. Thanks, Monique. And I know you have to juggle, so feel okay, free. I'll save a little bit. I'll jump and come back. <laughs> so our, um, I want to just kind of go over quickly our agenda, so you all know know what to expect here. So again, sort of the theme for this conversation is around community unity and health, and um, and I would I would use think of those terms as broadly and as flexibly as you want. Like nothing nothing is off limits in this conversation, and I think uh, what we'll do is we'll open up thinking about what are some challenges in that area. And maybe those are challenges given the current circumstances and the pandemic, or maybe those are more long, long range challenges. Uh, what do you want for your community in that area is the second, uh, second agenda item. Uh, are there promising practices, strategies, or programs emerging uh, around this topic area? And then what are your ideas for additional action that's needed locally, regionally, or at the statewide level that addresses the challenges and works uh, towards accessible uh, and equitable uh, recovery and renewal. And then finally, at the very end of the conversation, I'm gonna give a chance for our visiting team, uh, Will and uh, Bonnie and Monique to share a few uh, reflections as we bring things to a close. And Elena too, if you, if you want, I'll give you the option as well. So, so with that, um, as we think about community unity and what um, and health uh, in 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 central Vermont, let's say, uh, what do you feel like are some obstacles? What's holding you back? What are some challenges in this area? And and let me just say, in terms of a facilitator, feel free. We're a small enough group that if you just want to kind of unmute that, I can just kind of cue off of that. Like Denise, I think I saw you maybe getting ready to speak there. Feel free to wave your hand yeah. at me if you yeah. want to speak. Uh, oh, maybe not. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I just uh, had to had to had to get on my phone instead of my computer. That's all. Oh, I got gotcha. you. So maybe I'm so, not muted. <laughs> so anyone who wants to speak, just kind of unmute, and you can kind of wave to me, or um, if you feel the need to sort of raise your hand, there's a way to do that as well in in uh, in Zoom. But I don't think we'll have to do that. So, what are some what are some challenges in terms of uh, community unity and health? I'll go ahead. Um, my name's Ray, I live in Plainfield. And um, I think from kind of a health perspective, um, I mean, because it's not that services necessarily aren't available, but people who, who may have underlying health um, conditions, like I don't think things aren't as, resources aren't as accessible, um, appointments aren't as accessible. So I think people are not taking, like people are needing to deal with the immediate. Um, and so, being able to, I mean, just overall deal with anxiety, especially if it's new for people. Um, and then people with underlying health conditions, like doing prevention screenings, and, and it's just kind of falling by the, by the wayside um, for some people. So I think there's just not a ability to be potentially as proactive about one's health um, overall. And then there's this, the whole, compoundment of anxiety and especially around youth um, and what is really happening with youth, um, what's happening in the, even just starting in the schools. My husband's a teacher um, and just how traumatic it is um, for, for the students right now. And then kind of community, you know, everything is connected to health ultimately, um, but racism, um, just the divisiveness um, and I'll leave it at that. Right. Extreme 
And, and those were really three distinct things, sort of ac accessing care, especially sort of care that's more proactive, youth and the challenges they're facing in particular, and then uh, racism in general, those sort of th three distinct. Great. Others, what are, some, uh, what are some challenges or obstacles right now to unity and health? Yeah. Alice? Hi, um, I'm Alice Peel from Waitsfield. I'm on the Waitsfield Planning Commission, and I also am a member of the Transportation um, Advisory Committee of the Mad River Planning District. Um, Waitsfield in particular, uh, I'll speak to one thing that happened. Um, we went through a very contentious two weeks when um, the select boards were looking at um, issuing their own mandates for wear face masks um, in terms of uh, going out shopping, um, et cetera. Um, the towns of Warren and Faiston, which border us, um, their select boards issued a mandate that face masks were required um, in the towns. And then we got to Waitsfield and I happened to be at the meeting of the Waitsfield Select Board for another, for more of a planning commission update and Waitsfield kind of blew up into a very contentious battle. The Select Board voted down three members voted down um, a face mask manda mandate. And what happened in the meeting was I happened to be there and a few, uh, one of the select board chairperson does solicit um, comments from, you know, from members, uh, from non-members who were there. And it was very distressing to a number of us who cited our particular uh, compromised health situations and how this worried us. So two weeks into this, um, the select board came back again and had, well, I guess it was a week later, they called a special meeting on mandating face masks. And this was all before uh, the governor issued the statewide mandate. And what happened in the meeting was a, a, a myriad of anti-vaxxers, anti-max face mask wearers, um, specific medical professionals, specific scientists who gave, you know, real COVID, COVID data. And it was a contentious, crazy meeting with a lot of follow-up in the newspaper, a lot of follow-up on Front Porch Forum that got nasty, contentious, um, politically charged. Um, and then the governor issued his mask mandate and that all kind of went beside the wayside. But I see more of a healing thing that happened from that. From that contentious meeting came a group that is put together a group called Mad, Mad Cares, meaning the Mad River Valley Cares. And what they're doing now in our webinars and um, programs on Mad River Valley television um, to give people, advertise it, give people medical professional information, allow questions, talk about things that um, the towns have done well and are going well. Answer questions about the schools. Um, our big hot topic right now and our point of fear and tension would be the schools. But this small group came together and realized that they needed to do it from those contentious meetings. And now you're starting to see signs pop up, people saying, gee, you really got to listen to this. So um, they've done their first one, and I think 
they're going to try and continue um, doing these sessions. And I think that's a, out of something that was really divisive has become kind of a healing and a, um, a forum for people to be able to tell their personal stories, to get public health professionals and doctors and nurses and business people, people who own restaurants to get their perspective on their fears and needs. So that's Great. one thing I yeah wanted to talk about. Thanks, Alice. That's a that's a power powerful narrative with some tough points and some, and some encouraging points. Thank you. Others, uh, some some challenges or obstacles uh, that we face right now. Denise. Um, so I'm in Northfield, and I'm a board member of. Serve the Community Emergency Relief Volunteers, and we operate the food shelf and the clothing shelf in town. And you know, like I'm guessing everywhere else, we've seen an increase in usage of our food shelf, and we've been able to accommodate that. We've we've had a lot of generous donations from community members and some grants and other things that have kept us going. But our one of our big things now is as the weather gets colder because we have a very small facility and we actually had to move operations outside to deliver food to clients when they came to pick it up. There's not enough room in our food shelf for you know, multiple volunteers and people coming in to keep safe distance. So we ended up having canopies and boxing food and you know, people could come up and go through and get it that way. So, um, kind of a, an immediate challenge that I see for us is what we're going to do going into the winter. And we're still trying to figure that out. Um, you know, whether or not we'll be able to continue doing that outside or, or you know, finding another facility doesn't seem very practical, but um, we know that that food need will continue and, and possibly grow in the winter like it often does in the winter. So that's just a challenge um, for us at this point. Got it. Thank you. Others, uh, Rebecca, was that a little wave? Rebecca Hill? It, um, I wasn't waving, um, but um, I'm a nurse practitioner. I live in Montpelier and I'm doing telemedicine um, in an opiate treatment program in the state. Um, I moved up here a couple months ago, actually from Bennington. So my clients are still in the Bennington area, but I know this pertains what I have to say to um, patients in this in similar circumstances in in central and northern Vermont. Um, I agree with Denise. I'm very concerned about many of our patients who remain homeless as we go into September. Um, the other thing I'm finding is that. Um, and this is true nationally, many of our patients have relapsed or we're getting more and more new patients in. Um, and it's very difficult to get people into residential now. Um, residential centers in Vermont understandably, understandably have cut down on the number of beds so that there's some more, you know, there's attention to distancing, but that means longer waits. Also, they're requiring also understandably that Patients get a COVID test. It has to be done a week before their admission, but they're telling us it's probably going to be a two-week wait. So just coordinating all of that um, has been really challenging. And then added to that, many of our patients are not linked or not well linked with primary care providers. And so many of them are if they're taking new patients at all, it can be three months, six months wait. Um, so it, it's a lot, um, you know, you can't see these patients without trying to provide some sort of comprehensive care, but the organization that I work for is not set up to do primary care. And at, you know, there are days where I feel like I'm having the same frustrating conversations over and over and over, and we're just sort of band-aiding and, you know, trying to keep people going another week at this point. Thank you. Others, other other obstacles or challenges. Uh, Susan. 
Hi there. Yeah, thank you for holding this forum and for letting us have a chance to talk. Um, I'm the program coordinator for a small mentoring program in Cabot. And our, um, our main obstacle has been uh, the social distancing because we're a program that almost exclusively focuses on one-to-one -one in person time for youth and adults to help the kids develop social skills, to help them develop confidence. Um, and there just isn't any substitute for being in person. And I, there is no solution for that. And it's just been really frustrating for us. And on top of that, um, most of our mentors are older. So even when you know we're starting to open up and have a little bit more contact with each other, um, a lot of our mentors just can't afford to do that yet. So again, there's there's not really any easy solutions for our little program. We're kind of in stasis, but um, just sort of expressing my frustration at the state of the world today. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, appreciate that. Uh, Jim Bolts. Hi. Thanks for holding this thing. I think it's very very helpful. <clears throat> I'm a select board member in Plainfield and. One of the, I think, positive things that's going on right now is, is, is Zoom. We're holding our select board meetings on Zoom, just like we're doing tonight with this event. And I think the amount of participation we're getting is really quite high. Um, and, I, and that's been a positive thing, I think. When before this, before we had the pandemic and we had our select board meetings, very few people would show up, uh, maybe one or two. But now it seems that many more people seem interested and they use Zoom and Zoom has turned out to be a very positive uh, uh, resource to have. And I, and I think that that's been a real benefit. Thanks. That's, that's hel helpful. Let me ask you just one quick follow-up just out of curiosity. Maybe others are curious too. So when you have more participation, do you, are, are you able to engage them in terms of like, is there a public comment period or do you engage them on particular questions that are on the agenda? How, how are you managing participation via Zoom? Are there does it is it is it workable? Yeah, it seems to be. I mean, people raise their hand. We ask if anybody wants to comment we, at different times during the meetings. Uh, there's a specific uh, time on the agenda for public comments, but we don't hold people to that time frame. We usually allow anybody who wants to speak to speak when they want to, for the most part. Um, one of the most well attended meetings, unfortunately, was because of for a negative reason, but. Um, they, uh, but it still had tremendous turnout and people spoke up. And I thought that, that the fact that they did that and they were willing to participate was a positive thing. So I just wanted to give a shout out to Zoom and, uh, and using Zoom seems to be a, a very helpful thing at this time. Great, thank you. John, if I could, if I could just follow up with what he said, um, Zoom meetings yep. are, I do find, we do find the same thing, both with the planning commission and with the select board and the um, development review board. More people show up, more people watch so that I think more information that people are finally, you know, what do these people actually do? Um, we have it in two places. They can zoom in or our uh, local television station, MRV TV, We'll also broadcast it on the channel, different um, uh, local government groups. Um, and one of the things that was very important was we have been trying for a long time to connect more thoroughly the Planning Commission and our Conservation Commission. And the Zoom meeting with the Planning Commission and Con Conservation Commission worked because we had 100% attendance of both commissions. Uh, within the meeting room, it would have been, we would have needed an auditorium. So the, it does Zoom, we find it works quite well. Thanks, Alice. I, I see Allison with a hand there. And I, I think Michael might have been before me, so I'll see the floor. Ladies first, go ahead. You're good. <laughs> um, Thanks. I'm Allison Smith. I'm with UVM Extension 4-H. Um, previous to my current position, I was the Washington County educator. I am filling in for Molly McFawn, who's the current educator in this county. Um, but yeah, I think one challenge that's on our mind right now is just this 
um, idea that there's the potential for widening the opportunity gap among our youth. And as we are figuring out how we deliver, continue to deliver our programs um, and even expand our reach within the county and youth across the state of Vermont, um, how do we offer various delivery modes? And uh, speaking to um, Susan's point, a lot of our volunteers currently are in a population that are a little bit more weary of getting back together with youth, even as we're able to also do that. So that's a challenge for us, for sure. Um, and then um, to echo what Ray said about mental health and trauma among youth and how do we connect, how do we continue to connect people intergenerationally right now, I think is really important um, so that youth feel supported, but also that, um, you know, our older folks too feel like they still have connection with the youth in their communities because that's been something really central to 4 H. And, uh, and I see that being lost a little bit right now. Great. Thanks, Allison. Michael. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Mike Rama. I am representing Downstreet Housing and Community Development, and I am also a resident of Northfield. Um, so two, I've got two, two pain areas or, or problematic, problematic areas. One I'm sure you've all thought about, and that's the mental health of our neighbors uh, and isolation. Um, and I'm particularly thinking of those who are, uh, you know, deemed most vulnerable at this time. And I'll, I'll share, um, boy, it was about mid-April and I was, uh, a colleague of uh, an associate at Capstone Community Action mentioned that they uh, reached out to about 120 seniors just to like touch base and like, how are you doing? And food, you know, what do you need for food? And they reported that majority of those seniors, so well over a hundred, that was the first outreach they had got uh, and received. And that was a month into the shutdown. So I, I think that just paints a, a really bright picture that we've got a lot of gaps um, in terms of connection within our community for a lot of our uh, neighbors who are, are living alone. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an essential area, especially, in, and Rebecca mentioned that we're heading into winter, which um, forget about going outside. Uh, so I think that's a big piece. And another one that's been on my mind since the get-go of all this um, is, and, it, and it's not, probably just on the county level. I mean, I think you can run up the flagpole on a national level too. Uh, but there's been a lot of chatter uh, and suggestions about wearing face masks and, and physically distancing, which is great. But there hasn't been a lot of chatter about how do you boost your immune system during a state of, of you know, a, 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 a respiratory and health crisis, you know, take vitamin D, and try to get your heart pumping a little bit for as much as you can do in a day. And, and so I think there can be more guidance, um, particularly from a state level on that, uh, to just give people some more um, tips on how to boost the best defense they have against this thing, which is their very own immune system, um, which, you know, uh, it's kind of like a muscle, you got to work at it. Um, so I think those are two areas of problems, but also opportunities. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Mike. All right, I'm going to actually sh uh, shift gears a bit. And now, uh, and feel free if, if, if I'm skipping over you and you want to come back to that, uh, the, the obstacles piece, feel free to. But uh, how about what, what might a vision be in, in these areas in terms of like, what does, um, if things are working well in terms of community uni unity and health, uh, what what does that vision look like for you all? And maybe I can prompt. I mean, to some degree, your challenges. I think uh, uh, the challenges are articulate sort of where some of the um, the potential is. So uh, you know, Mike, what you just said about people in isolation 
it seems to me that communities where people are connected to each other, whether that's connected to neighbors or other um, uh, caregivers or others in their community who are sort of looking out for them. Um, that's, I would imagine, something that we are all holding right now is how are we, uh, what is that interconnectedness? What is that sort of web that, um, that makes sure that no one falls, uh, falls through the cracks and that when people are in need, that that, that need is, is being met by, uh, by others in the community? Yeah, I'd like right. to add on to that. Um, it's like, the word that comes to mind is matchmaking and it's not, it's not the best word. It's just like how there's so many people that have different resources. Like, so say you take kids, but the only people who can support kids right now are like within the school system. But there's a lot of people who could be supporting kids in other ways that's not through necessarily the school system. Or you take health and kind of supporting people with you know, immunity boosting or anxiety or, and they not, may not be in the health profession, but they're available to offer supports. Like how do we match some of these people? Because it's not just, you know, elderly folks that are, that are alone and living alone. There's a lot of people who are alone who haven't grown up in these communities and don't have a network of people. And if they're not in a really robust community where there's a lot of free flowing information, I mean, I'm putting as an example for me is, is how do you really connect with people without putting something out on front porch, front porch forum that's like, I need this, or I offer this, like something that's more integrated about being able to kind of match deliberate and intentional relationship building a, a kind of across the place. And then how does that ultimately help with this kind of this political divisiveness of being able to, to be friends and, and engage with people who are not in your immediate pod of like-minded um, kind of folks. So I don't, not a solution, but, but building on that and something that's, that's, that's organized and, and accessible. I, I can, uh, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, go for it. Okay, great. This is Almy Landauer. I'm the library director in Waterbury. And uh, I'll just offer something that we did in this town in response to the, the previous, um, comments uh sort of towards the beginning of covid we we put together a group um like one of our earlier speakers uh from i think it was um was it uh Brand bradford um we put together a group you know called waterbury covid um and we have conference calls um they start every week then every other week etc um and one of our projects was to put together something called Waterbury Cares, and it was exactly what um, the previous person was talking about. We, we created a, a Google form and also a paper version of it that we tried to distribute, although that was challenging, um, for people to sign up if they wanted to volunteer to help folks in their town, who in our town, who needed some, needed some support, whether it was doing grocery shopping, picking up prescriptions from the pharmacy, cutting somebody's lawn, um, just doing phone call check-ins, maybe help with childcare. We had a whole list of things and then a sort of an other, you know, uh, what other needs do you have? Um, and on the flip side, we had the same kind of questions for people who, well, so we had the, we had the questions for people who needed the assistance and questions for people who could offer some assistance. And, um, and then we, we dumped those, all the, the, that data into um, a, a Google sheet, spreadsheet. Um, and, and I was one of the, I am one of the people who do the matchmaking. So I, I, we check it every day. If we have a request for assistance, we match them up with somebody. We either connect them with phone or email, and then they sort of take it from there. And we've, we had well over 100, close to 120 people over the course of the last five, six months volunteering to help. We've had many less than that asking for help. But the ones that we did match up, it seemed to have worked really well. And I, we haven't been doing a lot of follow-up yet with, you know, having any statistics about does, did this, uh, relationship end up being ongoing and those kinds of things. 
Um, but from the feedback that I have gotten and what I do know, it has been pretty successful. Um, it, it very much, you know, dwindled as the months went on and um, we weren't sure we, we were, what we were hoping was that that was because a lot of people were already getting help from friends and neighbors in the community and didn't need to reach out to this sort of more um, anonymous, if you will, um, offer. So, so just, I, we're not certainly not the only community doing that. We got the idea from somebody else. Um, so the resources are out there to share and, and um, if, if any community is, is interested in getting it set up, there's, there's already materials, you know, to start from scratch. So, and I don't know how to mute myself again. I'm on my phone. Is it still star six? You know, I, know? I don't know that, but I have the power to mute. So I'll, I'll go okay, ahead and do it for you. Others articulate and, and this, this can merge with uh, a little bit with some of our other agenda items here, which is, you know, what's the vision and, and what are some ideas for, for addressing community unity and, uh, and community health or health of individuals in the community? Hi. Go for this it. This is Vern. Um, I'm in Barrie. And <clears throat> a group of people got together and called themselves Barrie Mutual Aid <laughs> um, in March. And we found a website uh, recovers.org that Waterbury actually used uh, during Irene and it's not perfect and then we found that there were a lot of people who didn't have internet and so we got a telephone number and what the person from Waterbury said happened has happened um, with us um, there are still people who are grocery shopping for elders or uh, people without cars with uh, single parents with little kids. Um, we have one-time calls, and uh, we look through our the database that we've collected through Recovers and um, try to find the volunteers that might be a good match or are available. We started doing um, monthly service to people who can use the Veggie Van Gogh. Um, we've helped people with just a long list of, of things. We don't, we haven't been doing lawn mowing and we don't have money. Um, sometimes people have just needed somebody to uh, talk over their issues or their problems with and help them uh, locate the correct resources or where do we get paperwork to file our taxes. So it, it's been uh, extremely varied and we've served people from Middlesex, Williamstown, Berry City, Berry Town, Berlin. It really doesn't matter because we're mostly on the phone. Um, and then volunteers do the in-person uh, services. And so I'm really excited that the outcome of this for me has been uh, that people have long-term relationships with other people in a part of the community that they would never have uh, connected. Um, I just wish that there was a way that we were more like at the library or that uh, our city council had um, taken us more under wing as a uh, making it easy for people to find. But we get referrals from the Family Center of Washington County from the Council on Aging. Um, 211 has us listed. Uh, so I find that being uh, really terrific. And as people are getting busy or going back to work, there are maybe fewer volunteers, but we're also not getting calls five days a week anymore either. Um, so that's just, that's why I came on this call because for me, it is about having community. And in, in Barrie, uh, I don't know what what it is about Barrie, but Barrie had so many groups of people, uh, immigrants coming to work in the granite industry. And I, I think that may be a part of why there are all these, there are all the clubs, um, you know, the Canadian Club, the Moutois, 
the Elks, uh, the Rotary. And so all those people have also taken on jobs in the city. The Rotary Club's been doing cleanup and helping the gardening center, um, the uh, garden club, to do gardening. And so there are things that sort of have fallen by the wayside that uh, the club seem to have picked up, but there's not a unifying place for everybody to get together, an umbrella. And that's something that would be nice to have without us all having to be... Um, personally, I, I, I get really tired from the meetings there um, because of my brain. It's hard for me to stay attending for a long time. So um, that's why I'm just using my phone. It's easier for me like this. Um, so that's what I'd like to see more of. And one thing I've noticed is that I've been getting more calls from people who have um, um, who have case managers from one agency or another um, and are something has fallen through the cracks and they find out about us. And so we, we, we do what we can to help meet people's needs. And, and it allows us to work outside the box. And um, someone from the Council on Aging said it was really great because we're able to do things that they can't do. Um, so uh, anyhow, I just wanted to say that I like what Waterbury is doing. I lived in Waterbury for 25 years, so I like Waterbury also. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, it's it's kind of fun if we think about the geography of, of Washington County, how many towns we have in this group right here. I've, I've, I feel like I've heard seven or eight different communities in Washington County. I'm, I'm kind of impressed with that. It's kind of neat. Uh, other, are there other, um, as we think about sort of uh, the future and, and how we strengthen our communities at this time and moving forward and how we look after each other's health, are there other sort of best practices uh, that, uh, or ideas um, that, that you all um, might want to share? Monique? Yeah, um, and this was for, oh, the tiles have all moved around. Uh, Susan, <laughs> socks. <laughs> um, so our, uh, I just met with the other day with our um, mentoring project for the Upper Valley um, and they were struggling with the exact same thing. Like they, they're not sure whether or not to let mentors and mentees in the same car, um, if they can't and how do they communicate with each other? Um, how do they have any sense of like unity with the whole organization? Cause they usually do like fun projects together and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if this is helpful, um, but I kind of offered to them to do like a, I don't know, I guess to brainstorm ideas on how to connect virtually and to facilitate um, those connections. And I'm doing like a, I don't know, probably like a an hour or something training with them. Um, and it, if I don't even know what that looks like yet. <laughs> so, but if it's helpful, I could share or record, uh, I guess I'm gonna do it in person, but I can still record it. Um, but things like, I mean, most of them didn't realize how many different virtual experiences there are. So one suggestion I'm gonna make to them is like trying to put together, like here's your virtual safaris and your virtual concerts and your virtual like movies. And uh, cause there's tons of stuff all the time. I think I just signed up one for one, from the Girl Scouts, it's got like a million people signed up for it, and it's a virtual safari through Afri like through African <laughs> lands. <laughs> um, so, and they just weren't aware of that kind of stuff, and and then they weren't sure how their mentors would connect to that kind of thing and be aware of it. Um, and then I brought up having probably like I think the easiest thing would be to do like a Google um, free Google listserv forum. Um, where like if I knew the address I could say oh the safari is coming up you guys should all sign up or the kids could say hey we want to attend this or whatever or mentors could say I'm going to sign into this concert um, if anybody wants to join me and and then have some kind of thing like a discord which really allows people to jump in and out of voice um, kind of like a uh, it's like old yahoo or ms chat like chat rooms basically you can easily jump in and out of voice channels um, so that if they're joining the same concert together, they could also jump on that and, and be able to talk to each other. Um, I don't know if any of that helps, but I, I'm totally happy to help brainstorm if um, 
if that's helpful and I can totally share what whatever they end up latching onto. <laughs> I would just like to say, this is Almy again from the Waterbury Library. I, that's a great idea. And I would just like to say, I would really encourage you to um, to partner with your local library on that because I mean, our whole business is about sharing information and resources. So I know our, our on our library's website, we have tried, you know, over the last five, six months, we have tried to add all kinds of resources for parents and families and just people who wanted and of course, it's all virtual, but um, people who, you know, might be interested in various kinds of programs and online museum tours and all the kinds of things that you're talking about. So the library potentially could be a central location for people to go to to find those those links and those resources that you're trying to share. Great. Thank you. Susan. Yes, yeah, thank you, Monique. Um, I would actually be very interested in a recording of that and to get connected with you outside this meeting. So thank you. Yeah. Are there others? Um, how about a, on the topic of health? Like when we, I mean, are there issues of access? I mean, think about how Ray, I guess you started, started us all with that question uh, there, there's, there are more barriers to access at this point. Um, those barriers can be sort of physical around transportation. They can be around cost. They can just be around availability. I don't know. I'm just uh, wondering as, as you think about where are there, where's the room for improvement uh, on the health front in terms of people's access to great care? Um, uh, what do folks think about that? My, my experience is that um, probably the biggest barrier is the availability. Primary care providers are, are leaving. Um, you know, there's an article, I think it was in the, the Times sometime this week, because it's just proven to be so difficult and so stressful, particularly if they're in an older age category. This has been the thing that's really uh, in their minds, force them to retire. I don't know what it's like, um, primary care here. With, with moving here a couple months ago, I did call a primary care group in Stowe. And um, I, I got what I, you know, the answer that I expected, which is fill out the paperwork. If nothing is really pressing with your health, and I'm lucky that it's not, we've got your paperwork, but we have absolutely no idea when we'll be able to bring you in and actually meet you. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't have any answers about um, increasing access in terms of the availability piece. It, it's dire though. Down in Bennington, as they say, those are the patients I'm still working with, they're going to urgent care in the ER for things that, you know, and those two places should not be seeing ankle sprains and sore throats and that sort of thing. I, I don't know what it's like in, in Montpelier if it's the same. Um, I, I think it's quite a huge problem around Vermont and probably around most places in the country right now, primary care access. I think there's, there's coordination efforts. So, when, you know, when, when different volunteers and people in the communities are the ones that are holding the space for say the mutual aid pieces. And this is what I was trying to kind of get at before is it's not like an immediate response to like the immediate needs right now. It's, it's, an, it's a coordination of, of resources that goes beyond just what's happening in, in one town. And then, you know, that links in with, with money and, you know, how can the information be communicated in a way that is accessible to the people receiving it? So people who really need help are, I think, being able to, for some part, find that help or make a phone call. But there's so many people that need help that don't necessarily, it's not an immediate, immediate need, and it's not easily available. It's, there's not, you know, it takes money to create a website. And then who's going to be able to create that, that can 
coalesce all of the information and all of the resources in a way that is easy to 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 reach and and reach out and understand. And I'm not not talking about kind of two on one with that immediate piece. It's just this this coordination between communities because everything is there's a lot of kind of insular in in the different communities and it sees something like VCRD like how how is there how is there more statewide weaving especially now that technology is going to continue to move and improve so that there there is kind of this more collective approach to being able to tap in tap out um, in a, in a way that's coordinated across communities and that doesn't have to just be that can build upon the kind of the small the mutual aid pieces that have started in different places and like get to a place like um, what Alice was saying and her her story you know to be able to be able to bring people together with conversations and holding space for kind of not the immediate needs but these bigger this bigger information sharing um, and it's it's shared resources and it's it's difficult when there's multiple nonprofits multiple organizations limited money pools um, and so many different efforts working um, not and not unintentionally not intentional together there's there's just a lot of different small coordinated efforts how can that be made to be a, a, a more robust statewide coordination you know that kind of moves outside of each town and spreads to the county and and it, it just takes a lot of resources and, and being able to ultimately communicate the information in the way that people receive the information. There's a lot of resources available, but people don't know about it. And it's, and it's not because um, it's not anyone's fault. It's, it's just that that communication kind of mechanism hasn't really, what wasn't, wasn't in place before COVID. And so how can this be kind of the opportunity to really have, I mean, it exists in multiple industries. Um, and how, how can this be an opportunity to, to, to build that? Um, you know, when do organizations kind of merge and become more than one and, and just kind of a, a bigger framework to be able to, to meet, meet more than the immediate needs, but kind of this long-term um, needs that people are going to need in this changing time. Great. Thank you. I think, I think, um, Ray, you make a really good point here. Uh, one of the things we also saw here um, in the Mad River Valley, so we're really, I'm Waitsfield, but if you think of the Mad River Valley, there are three towns that cooperate with each other for resources. And we decided the select boards decided on one emergency manager coordinator. But what wound up happening was tensions and potential ooh, pitfalls in small groups that, you know, are very, they had the best intentions at heart, but they also need guidance from the state, from the Department of Mental Health, uh, from the Department of Health, and from the Department of Mental Health, and the local emergency coordinator to make sure that what they're doing also was following safe practices. And um, having people understand that we didn't really need 200 volunteers right off the bat. What they needed to do was get a list of of volunteers coordinate that with the emergency manager who was quite good and then be able to distribute services and kinds of services like, you know, do we need transportation? Do we need, um, he coordinated out there uh, with his wife getting food delivered. Um, and we knew the services that already existed here that he could then contact and say, here's my new list of who needs this, who needs rides to doctor's appointments um, and coordinate that because we do have our own uh, senior and resident dedicated car for um, doctor's trips. But what we found was if there were a lot of little rogue groups going on that didn't know about each other, um, 
not only were you just duplicating services, but on top of that, were you following uh, safe practices in a pandemic? So we kept trying to funnel it to one source um, and it didn't, didn't work. Also, one of the things that was very good about the Mad Care Group as they started their education series is they invited a public health professional, local nurses and practitioners, uh, business owners, especially restaurants and their challenges. And they invited um, two students from Harwood, Universe, uh, Harwood um, High School to discuss what their concerns were about COVID and going back to school. And their remote, what it was like trying to be remote. And there's a lot of need, I think, for um, education on technology and uh, remote learning sources that the schools are gonna be challenged to do. So yeah, Thanks, it's gonna Alex. take a lot of state aid. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Every now and then, so, you know, we go through the exercise of trying to mapping all of the various sort of organizations and the geography that they cover. And your head, it starts spinning really quickly when you think about school districts and uh, all, all of the different layers and, mm -hmm. and the complexity of trying to organize with, with all of those different layers. And how, how do we impose how do we respect that and honor that while also imposing some order? It's a, it's a conundrum, I think. So, but yeah, it's important. So I'm, I'm also concerned about people who don't use technology um, and how they get information because it seems like we, we talk kind of talk a lot about the technology piece, but there is a group of people who, who aren't going to who aren't going to be in that um, kind of mode, whether it's they don't, they're older and they aren't going to learn to use a computer, they don't have good broadband access. So I'm concerned about how we reach those people with information about resources um, in some way that's comprehensive enough and current information. Um, and I, I think that's where maybe a larger, like a, a, muni a municipality or the state could play a role in helping um, spread the word, whether it's just even something as simple as um, some kind of a mailing to everyone about um, 211. I think that that's probably a service that people are um, unfamiliar with that, that a lot of times could be a solution for them if they just even had access to calling um, the 211 helpline and getting and, and being able to connect with someone there then to get there to, to go into whatever other organization or agency that needs to address their actual issues. So I don't quite know the answer to it, but again, I just think that that's a population that we need to remember still exists out there and it's gonna be with us for quite a while. Yeah, uh, Monique, go, go yeah. for it. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I think um, during the, the COVID thing when we had like the mutual aid calls, I think a lot of towns tried to do that. Like for Bradford, I put together a, basically like a one page letter that had like 211, the super basic mental health and, and um, medical health resources, um, food shelf hours. And then we have like a, a web page on our town website that just has all the other, like everything else we could think of. Um, that's expensive, but I don't know in the, in the interim of the state doing anything like that. I, I know us and pretty much every surrounding town ended up doing something similar. Um, we put extra copies at the town offices, the libraries, and um, the at the supermarket. Um, oh, so, we also did yard signs. I don't. That actually ended up working out pretty well, um, which I think Catherine Sims had started. Um, so we just did a yard signs with a phone number and um, a website on it around town, just saying like, if you need help, here's where you contact and that ended up being the source of most of our volunteer uh, needs requests. It's it's amazing the power of yard signs. A lot of you get a lot of people who just find them visual clutter but uh, we organized something in Middlebury 
around energy and and like there was a lawn sign that was part of it that that showed your participation and man that just like people were excited to put those lawn signs up in their yard and it was a way to build some some like visibility and momentum around around things so, so what are some other um uh mike go for it yes yeah, sorry uh i just i wanted to um kind of respond to kind of the dialogue around a lot of great work happening, but kind of siloed a little bit. Um, so I don't know those who were familiar uh, or have heard the, the acronym Winock Rock. So that was an effort that happened that spawned in March. Um, it was a consortium effort of, you know, 15 different nonprofit organizations and, and also um, Department of Health. Uh, as well, Joe Marie was involved uh, deeply in that effort. Um, and I, one thing that we, I mean, we formed to try to like mitigate any of those gaps for vulnerable populations, right? And like to mitigate the hospital surge and give support uh, and mobilize volunteers for the state wherever needed and also help on a local level. Uh, so two things I just wanted to share on that front. Like one thing we learned uh, through it, and I, I think got a good idea at the end, towards the end, is like, on a local level, mutual aid groups and volunteer groups, like, they stood up and totally were awesome. Um, and I think we all went into it thinking we'd have to, like, really get hands, you know, and boots on the ground, but they, they smashed it. Um, and on our end, what we ended up creating towards the towards the end of kind of the the spring surge was just a uh um we ended up bringing all the, or as many of the mutual aid groups as we could get contacts to together and we got a lot of good feedback about that because otherwise they didn't have that medium to connect and discuss what's happening what's working what are, what are your tips of how to solve this problem um, so that that connection piece, whoever it might be, is essential moving forward if we have another surge um, or just for another community uh, response scenario. Um, and uh, the other piece I wanted to mention, which I'm now drawing a blank on, because that's how that happens at 7.51 at night. Um, oh, I'll it might come back to me. So I'll, I'll raise my hand if it does. All right, if it does. So we've got about five minutes left before I'm gonna turn it over to our visiting team to share some reflections. And so I wanna, at this point, there's been a few folks who are pretty quiet on here and that's totally okay. But uh, I wanna like pause a second. And for those who haven't spoken, you might have some reflections you wanna share. So if anyone wants to do that, uh, go for it. Uh, Joan Marie. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Joan Marie Meisick. I'm with the Vermont Department of Health. I'm the district director for the, the Barry District, which covers all of Washington County and five towns in uh, Northeast Orange County. I'm also on the board of trustees for Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, and I'm a resident of Marshfield. So um, it's great to see neighbors. Um, and I, the role I've taken tonight is really just to listen. Um, I, it's a, an incredible opportunity to hear, um, you know, what's alive um, on the ground in community. So um, really appreciated everyone sharing and I've been taking lots of um, notes um, and have some things that um, I feel inspired to follow up on or to forward your message um and to um bring that to my organization so um thanks for sharing i i do also want to i would be remiss if i didn't put in a plug for um uh a, a an initiative called thrive um you may or may not have heard of it um it is central vermont's uh, accountable community for health um there are about um there are about 50 members representing 30, 40, maybe 50 different organizations and service providers um, from the region. Um, and um, we welcome everyone um, 
from, you know, if, uh, if you're with an organization, but also just a, a community member. Um, we have had to, um, you know, rethink how we're doing things during COVID because we used to meet in person monthly. Um, but what was happening, the conversation that's been happening tonight reminds me a lot of um, what Thrive um, was originally created for, which is um, to um, coordinate, communicate, and collaborate. And so much of what, I mean, the theme that I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of you is that that's, there's a need for that um, and for there to be a, you know, a convening of um, all of what you're expressing and um, the matching up of the needs and the resources. Um, and so one of the things, one of the things that I wanted to follow up with is um, perhaps getting a uh, list of the attendees of this event tonight from all of the breakout groups and extending an invitation to everyone to join us, um, with, um, join Thrive. So I'll, I'll leave it at that because I know we're coming up on time. But thank you very much. Thanks, Joan, and do follow up with us because we usually do send a follow up message uh, to everyone who's participated so uh, we can include that. Are there others who want to chime in as we uh, look to wrap things up? All right. It's like, how long can we go with the awkward silence? It's <laughs> well, this is Jim Volz. I'd chime oh, in. There we go. Hey, Jim. Hi. I just want to. I just want to thank you for doing this event. I thought it was really useful, and I really appreciated all the comments that everybody made. Um, and I thought many of them were very helpful and uh, and and enlightening. And so I just want to thank you and everyone who participated. Ah, thank you. Well, let's, uh, at this point, I'm gonna call on our, um, our visiting team to share some reflections. Uh, Will and Bonnie have been so patient, you know, where our visiting team is under some pretty strict direction to, to be listeners and look, they've, they've uh, done, uh, done well in that department. So um, Will, how about if you um, go first, if you're up for it? Sure thing, John, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of shout outs to start, um, obviously be remiss not mentioning the phenomenal leadership from VDH in the time of pandemic. So thank you so much, Joe Marie and Debbie Sanguinetti and all of VDH. Um, additionally, I see some representation from the Northfield Mutual Aid Group as well as SERV um, and just various, um, you know, downstreet, of course, in the building. So thank you, Mike, Knock Rock, Thrive, et cetera. Great to see so many friendly faces. So we're talking about unity and we're talking about health. And um, the thing that's really occurring to me more than anything is that we've created a lot of ways to provide help um, during the pandemic, but we have not necessarily made as much um, gain as I'd like to see on the ease of just asking for help itself, the destigmatization of the act of a person saying, you know what, things are, are really bad and I really have gotten to the point where I do actually need to reach out. Um, and just a small story to reinforce that, that is particularly um, poignant for me. Um, so, you know, in, in my position within AHS, I'm often called with these um, seemingly hopeless situations where things have gotten incredibly bad and people don't really know what to do. Um, that happened pretty recently during the pandemic. And generally the case was that a, a single mother um, had a, a home which was on the precipice of going to tax sale. And I got this email on a Tuesday and the tax sale was going to be on a Thursday, in fact, two days after that same Tuesday. So the person didn't reach out when they owed $1,000. They didn't owe you know, $2,000 when they reached out. They didn't reach out when it was three. They reached out when their home was going to tax sale and they had two days left. And that is not at all an outlier type of situation. So I just wanted to kind of reinforce for the community, um, you know, affiliations and members on this call that as much as it's critical that we continue to convene resources, to planfully tie them together, to avoid duplication, to target gaps, 
it's also in my mind equally critical that we normalize the prospect of just asking for help, making it acceptable to say that, you know, that that is something that anybody could need at any point and that is totally okay. Um, kind of following that riff a little bit more, this is a moment in time where I think it behooves us to really focus um, super locally. So we've talked about the role of mutual aid groups. Um, I think there are a lot of people in our communities who are particularly vulnerable in this moment in time. And it's very powerful for those among us who have some you know, political capital, resources, connection to large networks, et cetera, to really look out for people in our midst to not only have things like tax sales looming on them, but may not have you know, winter clothes or food or just even very basic things. That said, um, when we talk about unity, it occurs to me that for some, this has become a polarizing time where there's sort of this fractious view of the pandemic itself and what the response should be and what the role of people should be. But really, um, the opportunity before us is to rally as communities and really ensure that everybody in our midst um, has not just the basic elements of survival, but a real opportunity to thrive <laughs> and to have a, uh, a healthy and happy life. So with that, the final thing I'll say is on the health front, um, while there are tremendous obstacles, we've also seen tremendous innovation in this time of pandemic. Um, instantly, we had um, a shift from many, many households around the state being homeless and very precariously housed to a situation where as we de-aggregated the shelters and needed to spread, um, to reduce the spread of the pandemic, we were able to provide um, emergency shelter actually to basically every known homeless individual and household in the entire state instantly. So that goal of ending homelessness um, for a very short period of time was fully realized. Um, subsequently, in, in you know very, um, Short shrift, we were able to actually deploy a number of food programs that had a totally different delivery model where you didn't have to do an intake, you didn't have to, to go to you know, an environment that might be stigmatizing, you simply drove your car up and got it filled up with food and then drove away. So those represent tremendous innovation. We we're able to eliminate a lot of the transportation barrier services to allow people to just simply call in and maybe text a picture of some documentation needed to get into a program. So the reason that I mentioned those things is that they all have everything to do with the social determinants of health and this notion that a person um, really does need to be well housed, to have adequate transportation, to be sufficiently connected to a community, et cetera, to enjoy physical health as well. And um, I don't want us to lose sight of the innovations that we have realized in this time as we move forward in a recovery effort. Um, and perhaps this has become cliche at this point, but I think it is paramount that we don't just aspire to go to where we were prior to the pandemic, but we really use the, the innovation and you know, the uh, tenacity that we've shown in this period of time to propel to an ever greater place than we ever saw before. Thank you, Will. That was uh, well done. All right, on to Bonnie. Uh, I don't know if I can episode. follow that. <laughs> Nice job, Will. What struck me, I was looking up some things online today and you guys were perfectly in alignment with what I found. I was looking at some disaster recovery things and one of the things it mentioned was that communities that thrive in the recovery space do that because of social connectedness. So apart from the health that Will was talking about, it's, it's about community resilience. And many of the things I heard here today was, were about the human to human connections that were made. There were volunteers reaching out to help other people. And we think of them as the ones who are there to help. They're reaching out to make those connections. Individual one-on-one -on -one with a group um, of other either like-minded individuals or people who just may have needed that help. But that's the everyday space that we work in, is the human to human connection. And that doesn't go away at times like these. And we hope to be able to leverage that um, more into the future. The um, storytelling was the other thing I heard that I think linked together everything you talked about. Each person went through the pandemic and still continues to go through it with their own story and their own takeaways. And it's when we start knitting those stories together that we really create that rich picture of um, 
community unity that takes us to health. And it is that unity that really starts building community health. There's the physical people who went out walking together. There are the people who stayed in their homes, both to protect themselves and other individuals, um, but who might have reached out by calling their family on Zoom, something they've never done before, um, using that met method. Rather than a phone, you actually had a picture. But again, that community unity got back to the one-on-one -on -one relationships we built with each other or we built with new people while we were physically isolated from one another. And that was a story I kept hearing over and over again today. And what struck me was wondering how we continue to build on that, whether we're in a 2D picture or a 3D standing right beside each other. Um, and there were a number of, um, we heard a number of ideas today there are other pieces out there. East Montpelier has always struck me, they do a town newsletter. And it's different from a lot of newsletters I see because there's a piece in that newsletter, they always interview somebody in the community. And one might think it's always the, the, the store owner, the you know somebody everybody knows. But probably every third or fifth one, it's somebody somebody doesn't know. It was the person knowing someone and introducing that person to a community. And it might've been a new, someone new to the community, they'd been there three months, or it might've been someone who was there for um, six years or their lifetime who the community didn't really know. But those stories, by the end of those stories, you feel like you know something about somebody else in the community. Those little vignettes are that human to human connection that we all work to build. Um, and so I think our, our challenge, if you will, or the challenge I'd throw out at you as people who worked uh, tremendously through the initial stages of the pandemic is for us to figure out how not to lose what was built then from the human to human connection. So all those volunteers who wanted to help who may be back working now they were looking to build that connection. And once they head back into their regular world, they may lose it. How do we keep them engaged? Um, uh, I'm trying to think who used the example of, um, they were calling an elderly person and it was the first time they made a contact in April. Um, those calls might have stopped now that the world is starting to work a little bit more familiarly. Do they need to? Or can we still engage with those individuals and call them once a week or once a month to see how they're doing? So when I think, think about what you said and what you brought to the table, it really was those human to human connections and how do we keep them going? So that'll be my challenge to you and to myself, frankly, is to build those and keep them going. That's it, John. No, no bigs. No, that's that. Thank you, Bonnie. That was great. Monique, I wonder if you want to share a few. Uh, uh, I broke the rules and spoke earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I can follow that up. I would say, I guess the only thing I would add is just um, that this stuff all takes time and that like, I know I try, I feel like I'm way behind all the time on, on a lot of this stuff. And I noticed during COVID there would be times where uh, like the beginning, I just like dove in and was just doing all of the, the volunteer stuff and it was great. And then other times where I just like needed to not do anything. And the, I just think uh, trying to just be aware <laughs> that that's, a, be aware of like what your energy levels are and being okay. And that's like a super hard thing um, for everybody. Uh, and I guess I would just say be easy on yourself <laughs> and give yourself that. Thanks, Monique. Uh, Elena, I said I'd give you a chance. You don't feel like you have to, but I don't know if you want to share any any reflections as someone who's been listening carefully and taking some notes. Um, I just think something that's interesting that I heard on the radio today and it seems to be coming up, there's sort of this difference between sort of what's coming top down and what's coming between these sort of more egalitarian initiatives. And I think that that's something interesting and even with how we organize and communicate um, in remote working or 
planning, just sort of how we think about where that power is coming from and how we communicate and coordinate through that. So I think it's interesting to hear um, the different ways that that's happening, both with the state and the mutual aid groups and, and how they relate. That's great, thank you. Uh, and so now I, um, I get to bring us to a close. Uh, I'm gonna paste into chat just a little technical thing, which is um, the, we have a closing session I and the other facilitators have a challenge, which is to summarize our conversations and do a quick report back. So you don't want to miss it. Uh, I'm going to paste into the chat the link back to that closing session for anyone who needs it. And I want to just um, really express appreciation to you all for coming and participating. I mean, to me, this you know, as a facilitator, this just felt like uh, a really easy and free flowing conversation with uh, a wonderful mix of voices from all over uh, the county and some some really powerful themes. You know, when we, in my neighborhood, when we first went into the pandemic, my neighbor from across the street sent out a no, an, an email to all of us neighbors and she said I, at noon every day, she would be organizing a little exercise class out on the flat spot, we call it, which is like out in the street. And, and that's been going on since, uh, since March. And I'll be honest, I've participated once, but I have to say as a non-participant in that, who gets to watch it out my window almost every day, it enriches my life to just have my neighbors out there sort of participating in something and, and looking after one another. And, and as I listen to sort of you all describe all that you're doing, we, there are those of us who participate and serve. And then there's all of those others in our community whose lives are better because of that, even if they're not on the giving end of that or on the receiving end. And, it's, and, and I, I guess I'm inspired to think with you all, this inspires me to think about how do we what do we do as a community to make our, our, our communities more fertile for that work, that collaboration where we're looking after each other and, and where we seize the moment to do things for one another? Because what we know is that just makes our, all of our lives, I think, that much, uh, that much better. So thank you for giving me that, uh, that inspiration. And um, at this point, we're, we're due back in the other room. So uh, I'll release you. And, um, yeah, I won't leave right away so that you all can click on that link, but thanks everybody. Thank you.